Currently, much is being said in the national conversation about improving our educational system and ensuring success for all students. Hello, I'm Charles Ogletree, professor of law at Harvard Law School. I am here in Albuquerque for a national town hall meeting with frontline educators about the importance of race, language, and culture in education. Is that we as a society have to own this problem. Stay tuned. In the next 60 minutes, I anticipate a tremendously insightful and constructive conversation with educators gathered from around the nation for this Council of Great City Schools event. Dr. Williams, let me ask you, we're talking a lot about race now, and I just want to ask you, why are people in this very diverse audience, why are we talking about it? It's not that we haven't had open discussions about race. I think Plessy versus Ferguson was an open discussion about race national, nationally. Uh, the Brown versus Board of Education decision was an open discussion about race. But I think as you, as you think about that conversation that transpired and the policy decisions that were passed, the laws, of course, housing, uh, no discrimination, uh, so forth and so on, I think the national movement on that was, we've had enough, we've done enough there. We've pumped a lot of money into it. We think we've done what we're supposed to do with respect to race, let's move on. And you begin to see a fallback from, from a lot of that. Um, the fact that we have a president who's African American, I think has brought this back to the surface. Uh, the fact that uh, he was elected and reelected has opened up the discussion about race again. And of course, that's been emphasized, I think, by the incident with Trayvon Martin, uh, that race is back on the national agenda. Uh, Ms. Reed, let me ask you what, what happened in Cincinnati with the school board. Are, are you talking, it's public schools you're talking about, but what is, what, what's happening to the children? How are they dealing with the issue of race? What does that matter? I don't, I don't think that we're dealing with the issue of race very intentionally at all. Ah. I, I think that we do need to do that. Cincinnati is an interesting <laughs> Uh, demographic. It is black and white. That's it. Cincinnati has always been a really peculiar blend of north and south because it sits right there. It's like the northernmost southern city. So it's a very, very, very difficult um, place to talk about race. Uh, Mr. Carranza, let me ask you this, the superintendent from San Francisco. Is there room for not just race but culture and language? Are people being educated about differences? and, in a sense, embracing those differences. What do you think? I think that what I appreciate is that we need to take off the gloves and we need to have a real conversation about race. You go back and think about Trayvon Martin. Listen, I don't care whether you support the law or not or you're a jerk Zimmerman. That, that's irrelevant. The question is, why was this teenage African-American male not in school? Why was he where he was? And what were the systems that failed that student in keeping him engaged in school and driving him out? That's the question we have to talk about. What are the systems that are perpetuating a permanent underclass of, and in particular children of color? That's what I think we need to be talking about. And it's a hard conversation because it means looking in the mirror. It means being very honest about our biases. And there's not one person of color in this country that isn't racist as well. We all have our biases. We have our biases. So what we need to be able to do is come to terms with that and say, what is it? White, black, brown, we all have our biases. Those biases can affect the decisions we make in school systems where we're supposed to be teaching and educating children, not putting them on the path where we're pushing them out of school. Thank you very much. Let me ask you, Mr. West, what are we to learn from Trayvon Martin in terms of race? And what do you want to, in a sense, convey, not just to people who are around you, but to people who may disagree with you about that we have a race issue in the metro in the 21st century? If I were to think of all of the things uh, that exist out there that are on a scale from being most harmful to young children of color to least harmful to young children of color, kind of a Zimmerman scale, if you will. Yep. Yeah, obviously, uh, George Norman's actions landed you know, at a 10 on that scale. All of us have engaged in actions that are a 1 or 2 or a 3 on the Zimmerman scale of harm to children of color. And that while we certainly have an obligation as a society to condemn 
uh, behaviors that are you know, level 8, 9, and 10 actions that the majority of what our children are going to face are going to be on the other end of the scale. And that the amalgam of all of those harmful incidents over a lifetime is a large part of what is creating the circumstances that is holding our children back. And so if, if I had a, you know, a lesson for us as educators to draw from these circumstances, it would be uh, to really look within to identify you know, these the level one, two, and three actions that uh, our schools and our communities continue to perpetuate and to be actively engaged uh, in the remediation of those, whether that is for people who are white and that is born out of privilege, or for people of color and it's born out of internalized oppression and internalized racism. Either way, uh, there's work for all of us to do. Superintendent Silver, I'm asking you as someone who has to run a school system, what does race mean to you in the year 2013? We need to be very aware that our kids are individuals that race matters, that we all see color, and we educators, especially we have many educators who are middle class, white educators, need to learn and need to re-examine our belief system and what are our expectations for our kids of color. The data doesn't lie. We have an achievement gap, and it's not about poverty, it's about race. You want to respond? Reverend Al Sharpton said the 21st century form of racism is low expectation of our children. If I don't think much of you, I don't have to give much of myself. That is the new form of uh, racism. If I have a low expectation of you because you are African American, Latino, and what I find really interesting even in this conversation to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we have not talked about the Native American population at all. And so for me, how do you dissect that of a people that have had their land stolen, their language stolen? There is no way in the world I can stand here in this United States of America and not know that these are issues that come up. So low expectations is about, I don't believe you're worth anything and you don't meet my standard. And that has got to shift. In our district, we've been making a very big concerted effort to get more of our black and Latino kids particularly, but all of our kids of color to take the AP classes, to take the advanced placement classes, and to take more rigorous uh, classes. And we run into that, you know, that uh, low, ex that, uh, the low expectations from the students themselves, uh, certainly from uh, the parents. Uh, somebody mentioned in one of the sessions, I think today or yesterday, that there was a, you know, parent said, oh, I don't want them in those, uh, you know, those advanced classes because the work is too hard. One here, yep. As an educator, I, I knew all along that there were prejudices within my own race. Uh, if you were light-skinned, had good hair, teachers treated you differently. But I was alarmed when I started teaching at a Spanish immersion school and we had Spanish speaking teachers from a, a lot of countries how their biases against each other and the children where they came from it was alarming so I think we've got to go even deeper and look at the biases and prejudices that we have within each of our races and combat that before we can truly have a conversation. Well, if we're going to talk about racism, first we have to start by understanding what it is we're discussing. Okay. And so it is racism is about patterns of oppression targeting people based on oh, the color race. of their skin. Thank you. Uh, in order to have power to perpetuate oppression in society, uh, in order to be racist, you have to have the power to have perpetuated oppression in that society. By definition, people of color are not eligible to be racist. Now, that being said, people of color are constantly engaged in behaviors that perpetuate systems of oppression that are already in place targeting themselves. This concept of uh, internalized racism. Right. Uh, but it's important to distinguish that when people of color are engaged in those behaviors, they still lack the fundamental power at a societal level to enforce that. They're simply puppeting uh, the lies that they have been taught about themselves uh, by a larger dominant and oppressive community. So if we're going to have a conversation about racism, we have to start from there. Because if you start from any place else, we go back to this fallacy that somehow Trayvon Martin is responsible for what happened to him. 
And that is a lot. That is actually a lot. A lot of people in this room have been victims of profiling, but never talk about it. Has it happened to you? With my personal experience, I was white until I was 24 years old. Explain what that means to people. People don't understand that if they don't because understand. I was privileged. I live in a country which race. I was the lighter brown. And that created privilege for me. When I came to America, I discovered that I was a person of color. And then you start looking at what do you need to do to be able to assimilate and almost get into the system in a way that you can succeed without having the racism intended. But it makes a huge difference and makes it harder. I don't want the next generation to have to do that. They deserve to be themselves when they walk in. They deserve to acknowledge the fact that being bilingual is a luxury, it's a plus. Look at Europe, how many languages are being spoken. This country needs to evolve to understand that color matters, and we need to understand that we need to re-examine our own belief system and stereotypes. And it also says language and culture are benefits as opposed to drawbacks. Absolutely. I can enter in a bike. I am a bicultural, bilingual individual. I can enter into becoming a full Hispanic female talking to Hispanic families, and I'm authentic. That's who I am. And I also can navigate the system and go and experience the white world because I have been able to do both. But it shouldn't. You should be able to be yourself in both systems. I've been blessed that I have um, done well um, in this society um, and that I've been offered opportunity in this society. Um, but it certainly serves as a reminder uh, that that is not true uh, for all the uh, young people out there who look like me and certainly for the young people out there who grew up in low-income communities or foster homes. For me, it serves as a personal uh, source of pride I love who I am, obviously, uh, God made people of color the most beautiful people on the planet, so that's a bonus. Um, but in the context of our society, it's a reminder of an obligation if I want to be as successful as my peers who are not of color, that I'm going to have to be twice as good, run twice as fast, and be twice as strong. Um, it's a message that I think we have an obligation to continue teaching to our young people of color as they come up. Princeton Brooks right here in this front section as well. Uh, you're here, superintendent here in Albuquerque, and race is very different uh, in New Mexico. But what does the world need to understand about Albuquerque, uh, the, this diversity? Before I answer that question, let me just say that I guess Eric was saying we have the beauty of the beast here. It's <laughs> <laughs> not the first time I've been called beastly. <laughs> I've, I've been very blessed in my life. I had the opportunity to worked in Kansas for a while, uh, where about 30% of the student population is African American, about 30% Hispanic, and 30% uh, Anglo, and the rest other. Uh, I come here, and our student population is nearly 70% Hispanic, uh, very small African American population, and, and a rather large Native American population compared to uh, many of the other uh, cities which in and of itself you have to be very careful because we have the Native Americans on the reservation and then you have the urban Native Americans who actually go to schools in our schools, uh, which uh, again just goes to show you you can't just wrap everybody in the same blanket as if they're all the same. So uh, I think race means to us here that uh, you know, first of all you have to acknowledge, I agree with my colleague from St. Paul, you have to acknowledge in fact that you do have a problem. Uh, we do have an achievement gap uh, in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And although we've narrowed it a bit, uh, it certainly hasn't been at the rate that we, need to, uh, that we need to do it. I think we need to worry less about our children being educated about this topic and more about the adults being educated on this topic. Uh, but I think the way you deal with students is you send them to public schools. Um, you know, many people have the opportunity to send their kids to private schools and parochial schools and other kinds of schools. I think the way kids best get exposed to race and, and gather a better understanding of race is by going to public schools. Microphone.